Crush your enemies. They drew first blood, not me. See them driven before you? Oh, my user. And they hear the lamentation of the women. But I pity the fool. Glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. Phone home. They're here. I'm a real light sleeper, Charles. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Death Wish 2, or II, released February 19, 1982. It was written by David Engelbach, based on characters by Brian Garfield, with uncredited work from Michael Winner, directed by Winner, and released by Filmways Pictures and Columbia Pictures for different markets. Aye, aye. You make it sound like a pirate film. Yeah. <laughs> this one's at sea. No, it's not. That'd be cool, though. In 1972, Brian Garfield's novel Death Wish, loosely based on details from his own personal life, was published and quickly optioned for a film adaptation. Garfield was occupied adapting another of his novels to the screen, so the script for Death Wish was written by Wendell Mays, and Garfield was not a fan. In response, he quickly penned a sequel novel entitled Death Sentence, intending to correct the misinterpretation of his character as a hero. Dino De Laurentiis, producer of the first installment, still held the rights to the property when Menahem Golan announced out of nowhere that his studio, Canon Films, would be producing a sequel. Naturally, this was a surprise to De Laurentiis, who was not presently planning a sequel, and threatened to sue Canon if they didn't purchase the rights and follow through on the announcement. Cannon brought author Garfield on to adapt his own sequel novel, but rather than telling a new story and changing the character, they preferred to basically tell the same story over again in a new city. So instead of buying the rights to the second novel, they bought the rights to Garfield's characters and tossed his script before hiring David Engelbach to compose an original story following the first film's template. It, seems, it seemed like such a strange concept to me, coming yeah. into this one and being like, Oh, wait, all the things that are happening are exactly what just happened in the yeah. last film. Wait, it yeah. happened again? And so no one's commenting how, on how strange well, that and is? Now, and now I'm wondering, because I haven't watched the other ones, I'm wondering how many more of these movies is he going to have? Does he have any family members left to, like, you know, He doesn't have any killed? left at the first movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Garfield's Death Wish sequel, Death Sentence, was eventually adapted to film by James Wan in 2007, starring Kevin Bacon and Garrett Hedlund. But we'll talk about that film at the end. Obviously, the film's existence was contingent on Charles Bronson's return, but he had yet to appear in any sequel and held out for a $1.5 million payday. He also insisted on the casting of his own wife, Jill Ireland, as his love interest, with the stipulation that her character not suffer the extreme abuse which tends to befall the female cast of these films. Menahem Golan was quick to attach himself in the director's chair, and Bronson threatened to walk unless they brought back Michael Winner, director of the previous film. Luckily for him, Winner's career was in a lull, and he agreed to return, so Golan left to direct Enter the Ninja. De Laurentiis even briefly offered to cut Cannon out and produce the sequel himself, but Winner refused for some reason. I don't really get that, because it would have been a lot more money. Would he have the right to do that? Well, De Laurentiis owned the rights, and he was co-producing with Cannon. And right, he was but saying he, that. But he, I would have presumed that they'd have a contract together. That they did have a contract, but De Laurentiis was in a position to screw Cannon out of that contract. Okay. They, were, they were a much larger film mm. production company at the time. De Laurentiis allowed Cannon to move forward without him, but also assembled a team to simultaneously produce a similar film entitled Fighting Back, which we'll get to later this season. But I watched it, and we'll talk about that at the end, too. Where Engelbach's take on the character hewed closer to Garfield's, the filmmakers did a lot of on-set rewriting to set things more in line with the first film. Engelbach's draft was also set in San Francisco, which was swapped out for Los Angeles for budgetary reasons. Over the five films of this series, they bounced consistently back and forth from New York to Los Angeles each time. Looking to emulate the success of the Shaft soundtrack, Golan and Globus recommended contracting Isaac Hayes to write the music, but director Winner instead approached his own neighbor, Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page, who wrote and recorded the entire score in just 10 days. Hmm. That seems like he took longer than he actually did. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. For the recast role of protagonist Paul Kersey's daughter, Carol, despite the character having no lines, more than 100 actresses were auditioned. And knowing Hollywood at the time, and director Winner in particular, probably asked to expose themselves in doing so. Impossible to say how director Winner chose Robin Sherwood out of everyone who auditioned, except that she began dating him at the same time, and it was absolutely that. Ugh. Yeah. 
That's that was his girlfriend playing Paul Kersey's daughter in That's this movie. That's all super messed up for multiple reasons. It was set for a December 81 release, but to avoid contention with awards season, they pushed it to the following February, where it turned a tidy profit, earning $29 million worldwide from a $2 million budget, though Golan was fond of inflating the budget in public statements to $10 million in an effort to convince filmgoers it was worth their time. He also repeatedly suggested that Natalie Wood was attached to the project, which doesn't seem to have ever been close to true. It was critically panned and took home nominations from the Stinker's Bad Movie Awards and the Razzies for Worst Picture and Worst Score, respectively. For my money, not that bad a score. I think the Razzies got it wrong. I, I think Jimmy Page did something interesting here, and it feels like a predecessor to a lot of like jazzy, bluesy... It's unusual. Police yeah. I think, drama. Things. I think it's it, it definitely stands out for the time. Right. Which I but don't. If, I think it's been emulated a lot since then. Yeah, I I agree. Like I don't think the music itself was bad, but I felt like tonally it didn't necessarily fit all of the parts of the. Yeah, film. probably that's true. In the first film, architect Paul Kersey is working one day when a group of street thugs follow his wife and daughter home from a corner market. They kill his wife and rape his daughter Carol, who is consequently hospitalized and catatonic. The police make little progress solving the murder, and his son-in-law keeps Paul at bay while monitoring Carol's recovery, forcing him to walk the streets alone until he encounters more local street toughs, and despite being a conscientious objector to the Korean War, decides it's time to fight back. He arms himself, and walks the streets at night, luring muggers into shootouts, while Inspector Ochoa makes efforts to track down New York's anonymous vigilante killer. I won't spoil the ending for you here, because based on the current voting, the first Death Wish is almost certain to be next month's Patreon 50th anniversary review. But suffice to say, Kersey obviously survives, since today we're talking about a second installment. So in the first one, the he isn't really particular about, it's just any, any mugger will do. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, got it. That definitely changes here, and we'll discuss some of that, too. Mm -hmm. We open at dawn in Los Angeles. The camera floats along the city skyline, disregarding the first film's final scene in which Kersey leaves New York for Chicago. The title Death Wish appears with the Roman numeral, too. For the next film, they would switch from Roman numerals to Arabic numerals after a survey revealed that half of America didn't know Roman numerals. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird, uh, because I think we also said earlier that Jaws 2 was the first one to use the Arabic numeral mm -hmm. 2. It's like, so what didn't they, they use it before? What have they been thinking was happening this whole time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you don't learn Roman numerals, you'll never be able to know when major motion pictures were copyrighted. Yeah. You won't be able to rent these in order. Over the footage, we hear the voice of local reporter Jerry Nichols discussing the Los Angeles crime epidemic. I'm Jerry Nichols. Latest crime statistics released today show an alarming rise in violence. In the last five years, homicides in Los Angeles County are up 79%. Robberies are up 68%. Aggravated assault, another violent crime, shows an increase of 59%. The voice of a representative of law enforcement joins her and claims that the city is at war with these statistics and he will do everything in his power to win said war. This is a common refrain from the police characters throughout the franchise. They're constantly referring to these neighborhoods as battlefields and war zones. We move inside the suburban home of Paul Kersey, the notorious but uncaptured vigilante killer of New York in the previous Death Wish film. And possibly Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> He's listening to the radio broadcast with his housekeeper Rosario. Rosario doesn't approve of the general message of the broadcast because she doesn't believe in treating prisoners kindly. She thinks they should be harshly punished for what they do wrong. I know it's your radio station and I sure like Miss Nichols, but I can't take this. She flicks off the radio and Paul corrects, purely for our sake, that he doesn't own the radio station. He's just been hired to design a new building for the company, which is where he met his new love interest, reporter Jerry Nichols. Rosario complains that Jerry's show is going long and she'll probably be late for their meal. But Paul explains this is a pre-recorded segment just as Jerry pulls into the driveway. I feel like this is a very forced coincidence. Yeah. It, it, mm. it, it, it doesn't feel very natural. Uh, throughout the course of the rest of the film that he happens to be in all of these news places, like, th like the news building all the time, and yeah. everyone just accepts that this architect is, or engineer or whatever he is, is allowed to be in all these places in the building. Yeah, It, it, it seems weird 
that an architect would be given office space right in a building in the, in the studio in yeah in the studio I mean, it'd be like having your contractor live with you while you have your bathroom remodeled. I mean, like, I, I don't doubt that's happened, well, but, but, but they wouldn't get a full bedroom set. Presumably, wait, is he renovating the current building or are they building something I think completely they're building new? a new building. building. Yeah, new building. Okay, why are you in this office then? Yeah. Yeah, you should be on the site of the next building. You'd be building. either on the site or you're in your or in own, a trailer in parked your own outside office. The site. Yeah. And yeah, it's mm-hmm. just, it's all very bizarre. <laughs> and everybody acts like he's like, just a staple of this yeah, like, he's like radio co-workers. station. Yeah. Everybody knows who he is. <laughs> he, he's got free access to like the, the the news floor. Everyone knows him on the news floor. It's very it, weird. <laughs> it reminded me of, uh, gosh, what's that movie? Where the guy puts the stuff on the teleprompter and he's just walking around and no one seems to care that he's- Oh, The Seduction? Yeah, The yeah. Seduction. Where just, this guy, you can just walk around apparently. Yeah, nobody cares. You can just hand off paperwork to people and claim it's official and they'll just throw it in the stack. I also think it's weird, and I know architects make pretty good money, but that this guy in his late 50s needs, like, a full-time housekeeper that just walks around, like, dusting his apartment and cooking mm-hmm. him meals. It's like you don't have children to look after or anything. Yeah. Like, what? what is what is the necessity of this person? Yeah. I mean, unless, unless we're to assume or anticipate that his daughter would be coming home soon. Maybe. Like, uh, but- I feel like... What what really happened is that in an earlier draft, this was a wife, mm. and they needed a character that would be at his house and cooking and cleaning for him all day, but they didn't want to kill another wife well, he right did, away in the second movie. But he also demanded that they don't, so he wanted he wanted his actual right, yeah. wife cast, but she and wasn't allowed to be <laughs> killed. <laughs> they didn't have room in the in the film to like establish a relationship with a rebound relationship yeah. <laughs> within this story. Paul and Jerry cross town to collect Paul's daughter Carol and take her out for ice cream and a boat ride. When when she uh, she arrives and he's like they're get loading up into the car, she's trying to talk to him about all these things that she's doing. It's like, oh, I was interviewing the senator, and and look look they you know they gave me the cover of the magazine, and she's like he's like yeah that's great and slams the door. Yeah, <laughs> like he's not even <laughs> does listening not care to what her she's saying. All. Her doctors explain that she's still making a slow recovery two years after the attack that crippled her in the first film, which was actually eight years ago, but we're We're squeezing the timeline together. Later in the Chinatown neighborhood, Jerry and Carol are invited to peruse a table of crystal figurines while Paul gets them all some ice cream. In seconds flat, Paul has caught the attention of a collection of street thugs, assorted races with bizarre haircuts in accordance with 80s street crime tropes. Look at him. It's like, yeah, he looks like everybody else here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's nothing interesting about this man. The leader of the group, Cutter, played by Lawrence Fishburne, or at least I assumed he was the leader. He seems to be taking charge early, and it's Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, But uh, I guess they're all kind of like evenly the leader. Uh, But you think you would wait in line for someone who's buying something a little bit more expensive. Like, he's like, oh, he's buying ice cream. He's buying ice cream. He must be loaded. (laughs) (laughs) This guy looks like an architect that can afford a housekeeper. (laughs) Definitely. Fishburn is wearing those narrow glasses like Bebop always did in the original Ninja Turtles show. Although I'm sure they got that from this movie. <laughs> it re- actually reminds me of the, um, <laughs> the snow glasses. Oh, that, for sure, uh, yeah. The, um, oh, yeah, I know. The Inuit, Inuit snow glasses. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as Paul has his wallet in his hands, they snatch it away and he chases them down. The thugs all split up and the one Paul corners doesn't have his wallet. He does, however, have a switchblade and Paul manages to disarm him and throw it over a fence. He returns to his girlfriend and daughter to announce that he left his wallet at home and Jerry will have to pay today. They take Carol down to the docks to board the yacht of a family friend. Paul excuses Jerry to conduct an interview with a visiting senator and boards the craft with his daughter. Across town, we see a yellow van pull up outside Kersey's home, and in the passenger seat, we see the thugs have found his address from the ID in his wallet. His ID here indicates that he's 45, but the actor was nearing 60 at the time of filming. In saying that they would bother to track down this man when all he did was toss one of their knives over a fence. Like, mm-hmm. just walk around the fence and get your knife. But I guess if he'd done any more, the viewers might be tempted to blame him in part for what's about to happen. I think we still can, maybe, yeah. a little bit. <laughs> Inside, we watch Rosario preparing a meal as the thugs sneak up to every available door. There's a, a great reveal, like, where they walk up to the van and they slide open the door to reveal the inside of the van. It's literally just a crowbar sitting in the middle of the wood floor. Perfect. <laughs> it's just like, it was just there the whole time, like, yeah. not rolling around. Not, like, when you were driving, just like, just sliding yep, back just and forth right there. whenever you drive. The thug on the porch poses as a delivery boy until Rosario calls his bluff. 
They surprise her by breaking in from both directions simultaneously, and once inside, they converge on her and tear off her clothes. What follows is a needlessly brutal rape scene, and there's nothing more to say about it, so we'll skip it. Five minutes later, Paul is finally arriving home with his daughter, and she's holding in her hand a small crystal cat she bought from the table by the ice cream stand. Apparently, the actress kept a collection of crystal cats, and the director liked that detail. And he knew this because he'd been to her house, because she was his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. As soon as he gets through the front door, the thugs pile out of the bedroom and quickly knock Paul unconscious, kick Rosario to death when she tries to phone the police, and then take Kersey's daughter away with them. We get lots of gratuitous shots of Rosario's fully nude corpse on the floor, and we end on a close-up insert of the crystal cat sitting in the carpeting. The thugs pile into the van and drive away with Carol. We cut to the tail end of Jerry's interview with the senator, and he asks the standard anti-death penalty question. Why do we kill people who kill people? to show that killing is wrong. Thank you, Senator. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a female broadcaster host an anti-death penalty segment from the perspective of her widower boyfriend observing the broadcast, whose wife had previously been murdered in front of their daughter during a home invasion? A uh, stranger is watching? That's correct. That sounds right. <laughs> Should a civilization protect itself by taking the lives of those who have themselves taken a life? The thugs kick back that night in their hideout in some derelict warehouse. They all argue about how well the witnesses might be able to describe them to police when suddenly one of the men is eyeballing Carol. Evidently, he's ready to claim another rape victim. Carol doesn't make a sound because she's still in a state of traumatized shock from the incident two years ago. Again, we get a long, drawn-out, and generally pointless rape scene, which, frustratingly enough, wasn't even in the script. It was a creation of the director on set, and he advised the actors playing the thugs to improvise a lot of it. The director who's whose girlfriend her. this was. Yes. yes. What? Mm-hmm. Ah, so fucked up, man. Several worthless minutes of screen time later, Carol suddenly turns to get on her feet and runs full speed across the room, leaping through a glass window, and falls several stories down to impale herself through the chest on a spiked fence below. Ugh. Engelbach's script called for her to do this before anyone was able to abuse her again. But the director saw an opportunity to put more boobs in the movie and didn't care how fucked up that was. But Engelbach's script literally didn't have a rape scene in it. Right, but I, and I feel like there's a point to that, that right. she's lived through this trauma. We don't and have she to do this rather, to the character twice. She would rather jump through a plate glass window and possibly die than face this trauma again. Right. Which I think makes more sense than what she does here, which is to sort of traumatically lie lifelessly while this happens right. to her. I, I think it actually gives the character so much agency to show that she yeah. had the strength to do this yeah. instead of endure this travesty a second time. Yeah. And then they just threw it out the window because they were like, people want to see boobs. No, so like it's but <sighs> but but not This is so hard I, I, to watch. Yeah it's in the first movie, I think the directing is better it's the same director, but I think the directing is better to make you disgusted by what's happening. Here, I really think that he was doing it to put, he thought that people would be aroused watching this. Like, I think that's, See, it seems fetishized. Th that, that, that's, that was my problem with both of these rape scenes is like, this is, it's going on so long and it's so graphic that it's almost sensational. Yeah. And, and it just is like, it's like, it's like skip, 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 skip. Yeah. And, and screenwriter Engelbach had said publicly that he felt like the director was tr trying to get his rocks off shooting these scenes this way. It's, it's so, Yeah. It's so hard to watch. Honestly, I think it ruins the movie. Yeah, I 100% I agree. Sometime later, Jerry is pounding at Kersey's door, and the knocking wakes him up, so he answers the door, gripping his aching head. Jerry sees Rosario's dead body naked on the ground behind him and nearly vomits. I feel like I would be worried that my boyfriend just killed his housekeeper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's weird that there's not even a conversation about yeah. it. Yeah. Also, being unconscious after being struck on the head for apparently like six plus hours. Yeah, it's been a long time. That's it's night now. a long time to be unconscious. We hard cut to police swarming a crime scene and Kersey can't provide a useful description of the thugs, despite probably recognizing them from their encounter earlier that day. It already seems like his plan is to take care of them himself. When the cops run his name through their system, they're shocked to learn that this is not the first time that Paul Kersey's family has been attacked by a random street gang. I feel like I would be suspicious of him at this point. Yeah, right? Some muggers followed my wife and daughter home from the market. The police there got a very good description of the muggers too, but it didn't do any good. We do what we can. Jerry invites Paul back to her place to get some sleep when the police get word about Carol. 
We cut right to the morgue, where he's being asked to identify her body. Is this your daughter, Mr. Kersey? Mr. Kersey, is that Carol? I get it. Like, she thinks that you sh- you wouldn't want to be in this house. Yeah. But if they're going to call about a ransom for your someone daughter. Someone needs to be here. Th- someone and he should be, be by the phone. Yeah, if they're going to call for you. We cut to him at Jerry's apartment later that night, but he still won't sleep despite her pleading. Kersey's boss catches up with him at Carol's funeral and reminds him that the work he has can wait, but Kersey seems eager for the distraction. I feel like it's not even necessary to say this. It's like, hey, I know your daughter died. Guess what? I'm going to give you a couple extra days to turn in that (laughs) building design. It's like, uh, fuck you. I'll turn it in when I feel like it. You didn't have to give me an extension. We also learn that his boss has a cabin and he offers it up to Kersey as a place to stay while things get straightened up at home. But he only stays here for like the weekend. It's mm-hmm. a weirdly pointless detail. Yeah. I, I, what I thought was what it was going to be was a montage of him doing like booby trapping a house. <laughs> that would have been cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, but more more so doing like different outdoor things to strength train. Oh, okay. Because he's probably out of practice. And so I thought you know chopping wood and. And going on hikes, like the, doing some stuff to build up some stamina. Haven't yeah. murdered some people in a while. Exactly. Got to get back in murder shape. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It's a serene place out in the wilderness, and we see Kersey chopping firewood beside a small stream. The chopping gets angrier and more aggressive as he goes, but a lot of the wood is just falling in the river. <laughs> Kersey takes the small crystal cat that the police return to him and sets it on a table in front of a family photo. We cut back to Kersey's job where he's turning in his architecture assignment and sharing all the prices for the various exterior options of the building that Kersey's assistant prepared for him. Like, he didn't do any of this work. He's he's like, I have people skills. I'm good at dealing with people. What the hell is wrong with you people? He just, I take the plans from my assistant and I give them to the building buyer. Jerry follows his voice into her boss's office and asks if he's up for dinner tonight, but he's still healing from his daughter's passing and doesn't think he'd make good company. Later in the day, the police stop by again, hoping to collect more useful descriptions of the men who broke into his home, but he's no more cooperative this time. That night, he heads to his local fried chicken place, Pioneer Chicken, and catches angry glares from a load of punks waiting outside. Walking away, he sees people breaking into cars and just shakes his head in disappointment. He takes two bags into a public restroom to change into his all-black vigilante uniform. (laughs) Except (laughs) the key element of this outfit is like his little Knit cap. Yeah. 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 The whole rest of the movie, teeny weeny beanie, is just going through my head. (laughs) Have you seen that sketch? I have not. Oh my God. I have to show you this sketch. It's Paul Rudd and Jimmy Fallon singing the teeny weeny beanie. Yeah. That's funny. (laughs) Whether I'm in my house or out on the street, I want a hat right now that can bring me the heat. It's a teeny weeny beanie. It's a teeny weeny beanie. It don't cover your ears because you still need to hear. It's a teeny weeny beanie. He drives by an hourly hotel and then walks past a rescue mission homeless shelter before deciding on a paid living space. 50 bucks a month for a small apartment. He pays cash and gives the landlord a fake name. In the park later, he wanders around, hoping to be mugged, but nobody does him the favor. The next day, he's back in his bed at home, and Jerry wanders in to surprise him, kissing him awake. Shall I join you? Joe. Well, who were you expecting? Raquel Welsh? He hops in the shower and tells her to go away. Why don't you go on and do what you're going to do, and I'll see you back in the office. The second she's out the door, he calls a locksmith to prevent any future surprise wake-up calls from Jerry. Well, yeah, as I say, like, you know, you're supposed to be, like, good at what you do. Yeah. And and the fact that, like, you were so sound of sleep in your bed. That someone got in with you. Thank you for calling General Lock Company. Hello, yes. Uh, I have some locks here that need changing. Could you do it for me today, please? But also the fact that he's, like, changing the locks. It's literally just to keep Jerry out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it has nothing to do with the break-in because yeah. those guys didn't have a key. <laughs> that night, she tries calling him and can't get through. Kersey sits on a bench and a crowd of Hare Krishnas march by. And between the passing chanters, he spots one of the punks that took his wallet before he tried to buy ice cream. Specifically, Stomper, played by Kevin Major Howard. Stomper meets up for a drug deal with another pair of gang members, but just as the goods are trading hands in the lobby of the abandoned Hollywood hotel, swarming with rats. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so many rats. <laughs> why are there so many rats? They're, like, on the lampshade. Maybe that's why the hotel closed. Falling off of things. <laughs> yeah. I was like, man, I hope he doesn't step on one of these yeah. rats. Willard is in here somewhere. 
I just I'm just trying to imagine like the PAs on the side of the set. Just throw throw another rat in there. Yeah, more rats. Just stick one on top of the lamp, and then that one falls off as soon as they <laughs> <laughs> action. <laughs> Kersey accidentally knocks an empty soda can down some stairs, drawing attention to himself. When the gang members spin to face him, Kersey takes one of them out and then orders the other two to leave so he can deal with Stomper alone. He notices Stomper's crucifix necklace and parlays it into one of the franchise's more memorable one-liners. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Well, you're going to meet him. He shoots the man again on the floor and walks out. I, I thought there would be some questions. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> like where are where, the rest of the guys? Well, yeah. did this. What did you do to my daughter? I mean, I guess you could figure maybe he won't crack, but I'm sure he would. He this one this one especially seems like would be the one to crack. Yeah. We see Kersey back in the filthy apartment, and then he pulls up outside his own home where a block party seems in full swing. Like there's a bunch of people in the street who know his name and say hi as he's going in. Inside, his phone is ringing, and when he answers, it's Jerry. He claims he's been avoiding the phone because the press keeps calling. But she's the press. Yeah. <laughs> is that what he means? Yeah. Your coworkers <laughs> keep calling me, so I haven't been answering my phone. They make dinner plans for Friday, and Kersey sits down to watch the nightly news report on his killings. He drives back out to his tiny apartment and changes back into the vigilante uniform. Walking the streets that night, he hears a woman scream and saves a middle-aged couple being attacked by gang members in an underground parking lot. He follows one of the attackers away to a second building where the gang member catches Kersey off guard by luring him in front of a wall of boxes and then blasting full speed through it with a forklift. It's like, how did you know yeah. that this was going to happen <laughs> and that he was right there? That doesn't make any sense at oh all. Oh my God. I, I, I had a note here was like that apparently he had spent meticulous time setting up this yeah. wall of box trap. Did you build this behind you after you parked the forklift in this little alcove? Kersey barely avoids being crushed and puts the man down with a couple more shots before leaving. Sirens near the building and Kersey makes a run for it, and the cops stumble across the body impossibly fast. This is an empty, abandoned warehouse, and they found a dead body in like three minutes from when he got shot. you think they would be more focused on where the tourist couple yeah. is at this point. But that's what's crazy about these movies is that the police, in, in all of the Death Wish series, if you get killed or like your family gets killed, they'll take days, weeks to respond. And the whole point is the police take too long to get to murder scenes in this town. But if a vigilante does it, they're yeah. there within seconds mm -hmm. every time. They care more about these gang members than they do about all the taxpaying citizens. More cops interrogate the couple Kersey saved and demand a description of the vigilante. Inspector Mankiewicz insinuates that he would withhold medical attention if they are uncooperative. Now don't play games with me, you both saw him. Now I want a description. It's 21. Blonde with a club foot. It's funny. From where I was, he was a large black man with a red beard. Now you let these guys get me to the hospital, or I'm going to give the press interviews you won't believe. Inspector Mankiewicz surrenders, and then delivers the line we hear at least once in each of these films. You know what we got here, don't you? A goddamn vigilante. Mankiewicz shares his findings with the mayor, who worries that they could drive the city into a panic. He recalls another vigilante in the news from about five years back and suggests reaching out to the local police in New York to hear how they dealt with it. We cut to New York and Vincent Gardenia reprising the role of Detective Frank Ochoa from the first film. He closes an office door to inform the New York police commissioner in private that L.A. is asking how they dealt with their vigilante for advice regarding their similar problem. Ochoa reminds the commissioner that Paul Kersey, the man they pinned New York's vigilante killings on, now lives in Los Angeles, and it's more than likely they're dealing with the same man. Ochoa explains away the change of locale here by mentioning that Kersey worked in Chicago briefly before moving to the West Coast. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's been eight years. Mm. Like, we could just tell the Chicago story. I don't know why we skipped it. The commissioner worries aloud that if Kersey is caught and it's made public that they let him leave New York a free man, they could all be brought up on charges. How would they, like, this was a little bit of a leap for me. I agree. How would they know that... They think Kersey would give it up. That he would rat them out. And I don't know that why. That they figured the, out who he was? Yeah. Because that, that's what happens in the first Death Wish movie. 
But they figure out who he was, and they're like, yeah, you're killing bad guys. Whatever. Just get out of here. Because if we arrest you, the public's going to hate us even more than they already right, do. Right, right. No, I, I get I get how that movie ended. But so, so they're afraid that if he gets caught here, he's just going to tell on them? Yeah. I don't know why he would do that. I don't know either because- like, Because that, they let him go. <laughs> and that would be admitting to the other crimes. Correct. Yeah. And also- why would the police in L.A. trust him over the New York police commissioner who would say, no, we never caught that guy. Remember when we never caught him? That's how you know we didn't catch him. He doesn't have any proof that they caught him and let him go. Yeah. Well, but I, I just don't know why he'd want to associate himself with like a whole bunch more murders that they could still prosecute. Him it's for. just an excuse for the commissioner to order Ochoa out there. So Gardini, can play I know it just feels too. sloppy. I agree. The commissioner worries aloud that if Kersey is caught and it's made public they let him leave New York a free man, they could all be brought up on charges. If he's caught now, he'll tell the world we let him go. He'd be disbarred. It'd be the end of your career, Mr. Commissioner. And you, Inspector, would not collect your pension. And I retired this year. <laughs> what a dumb thing for a policeman to say in an action movie. Yeah. I'm just a few months away from <laughs> retirement. <laughs> Probably makes more sense to say, I retire today. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> The commissioner assigns Ochoa to a new case. Find Kersey and see if he's back to his old tricks or if this is the work of a bizarrely similar vigilante in the same city. But don't bother arresting him this time. I'll try to stop him. Quietly. Kill him. Ochoa arrives in L.A. and the local authority fill him in on all their vigilante files. Ochoa coughs and sneezes through all these briefings, a callback to the persistent cold that affected him throughout the first installment. Again, like, why are we just completely redoing this original movie? I don't movie? know. Jerry Nichols arrives home to her apartment with a bag of groceries and drops everything to the floor when she hears Ochoa snoring in her living room. He quickly explains he's with the police investigating Kersey, but why in God's name would you plop yourself right here in this woman's apartment when she's freshly traumatized from having stumbled across a corpse in her boyfriend's home mere weeks ago, or maybe days ago? And she's weirdly accepting yeah. oh, as mm. soon as he's like, oh, I'm a cop, and she's like, okay, that's fine. I'm like... So what? Get Hold on, I got a badge here. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't show me your badge. I believe you. Don't you dare show me your badge. Even less explicably, he immediately blurts out the conclusion of the first film to let her know. So now she can corroborate Paul Kersey's story if he does decide to give right. up the New York police. He killed nine people in New York City four years ago. You're not serious. I'm very serious. Ochoa explains further that Kersey was never charged since he was very popular with the public and technically a benefit to the city. Jerry doesn't believe Ochoa's story, but does lament how little she's seen of him lately. Doesn't it make you wonder what he may be doing at night? We see Kersey doing the usual rounds, and arriving home that night, he catches Jerry struggling with the lock on his door. Uh, when we're when we're following uh, Kersey walking around the streets, he's walking down an alley, and there's a big sign. And uh, I wasn't much very well this week, and so I was a little delirious. But when he walked past this big sign, it said "marital AIDS." I was like, "What the what the heck is marital AIDS?" <laughs> I was like, "Why would Something you have only a... spouses can give to each other?" <laughs> we should have a sign promoting it. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh wait, marital AIDS." <laughs> Arriving home that night, Kersey catches Jerry struggling with the lock on his door. She peppers him with questions, and he pleads with her to calm down. What do you think I've been? Killing muggers? He tells her the New York inspector Frank Ochoa is a total kook and not to be trusted. He confirms that Ochoa asked him to stop killing muggers, but insists he was never doing it in the first place, and Ochoa just wouldn't accept his side of the story. Kersey points out that if the police knew Kersey was responsible, he would, of course, be in jail. He was just getting the blame since he had a motive in the form of his recently fractured family. To shut her up completely, he invites her to please stay the night, and she accepts. Stay the night? I thought you'd never ask. The next day, she asks for a copy of the new key, and he quickly hands one over before dropping her off at the station where she works. I wanted him to immediately call the locksmith and be like, uh, I have some locks here that need changing. <laughs> <laughs> I need to change those keys again. Uh, I guess I lost one of them today. But when he hands it to her, he's like, you can get a copy, meaning this is your key. And he's like, yeah. give it to me later. And and then uh, you can give it to me later. He's like, oh, wait, I'm not going to. I'm busy tonight. So I'm like, how are you going to get in She's your gonna house? She's going to sleep on his porch <laughs> later. Ochoa phones a reporter friend named Mike and asks him a favor to park his car across the street from Kersey's house to give the impression of constant surveillance. Mike does the favor. And to avoid the car, Kersey sneaks out the back door down an alley where Ochoa begins tailing him in a second car. 
After he parks to follow Kersey on foot, Kersey boards a cross-town bus, and Ochoa leaps into traffic to commandeer a vehicle. The lady, <laughs> she's so excited. Yeah, yeah. she's <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. The second he says he's a cop, like everyone in this town just believes you instantly, <laughs> and they're super excited about it. <laughs> Ochoa tracks Kersey to the second apartment. He hops into a taxi to follow Kersey in a second bus to an open city park. He spots the remaining three thugs from his hit list dancing to a radio. After a while, they start harassing a girl at a bus stop, and Kersey gets on a third bus with the three thugs and the girl. I <laughs> I just want to know, in the 80s, did people just randomly dance in parks? Like, is this a thug activity? Mm-hmm. I've done a lot of research in the last in five parks. years, and yes, they did. <laughs> I don't know how accurate my research is. It's based entirely on the films of the last three years. Like, could you imagine, like, three really tough-looking dudes mm-hmm. just, like, dancing with each other on a stage in a park? I mean, I imagine <laughs> that they're looking for marks or, or yeah. something, but... but Or maybe they're just living life, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's not Sorry. I'm not... I'm not... I'm not judging. <laughs> I just want to know if this actually happened. <laughs> Kersey watches from across the bus as they continue to harass the woman, and when she gets off at the next stop, Kersey stays on board with the rest of the gang. They finally get off and wander into the unlit Point Furman Park, and Kersey follows them into the shadows. Ochoa has his cabbie wait here for him, and tears a 50 in half to reserve his time. You wait here. You get the other half when I get back. Whatever happens, wait here. That's not all he tells him. He says... And if you hear shooting, it's just target practice. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just like, I'm, the second I, you you warned me that there's going to yeah, be a shooting, I'd be like, I'm out of here. Half of a 50 <laughs> is not enough for me to sit here and get shot at yeah. later. The gang meets up with an arms dealer in the park, and they trade drugs for weapons. Just classic barter system. No reason to bring cash into this. Ochoa watches Kersey watching from the bushes and then spots a sniper from the arms dealer squad, waiting in the trees. Is that who that was? I'm like, yeah. Who, yeah. who was in the tree? He was waiting in case the deal went wrong to start mm-hmm. picking off the gang members. Okay. Yeah. But insanely, the sniper gives away his position by shining yeah. a big flashlight down out of the tree into the bushes, and before he can fire on Kersey, Ochoa calls out a warning. Watch out! What the fuck is going on? Why did you need a warning? A giant flashlight just <laughs> yeah. shined on you. Yeah. That, that's insane that the whole point of being a sniper and being up in this tree is so that people don't know you're there. Why would you have a big spotlight the whole time? Ochoa shoots the sniper down, and Kersey begins firing on the freshly armed gang. It's too bad this trade wasn't going the other way. Mm-hmm. It's like we, they just gave away all their guns for drugs, <laughs> and then they're just getting perforated by Kersey. Ochoa joins Kersey, but the gang is overpowered on weapons now, and Ochoa is quickly taken out because he's not even using a tree for coverage. He's just firing wide out in the open. (laughs) Kersey hits one of the gang members through the windows of the car they're hiding behind, and then Cutter, the Larry Fishburne gangster, tries to shield his face with a boombox, so Kersey shoots right through it. And it's a really awesome shot of this boombox exploding in half in his hands as his face is, like, demolished against a wall. The arms dealer pulls away in the car they were hiding behind, leaving another thug out in the open for Kersey to plug. Not fully satisfied, Kersey continues firing on the departing car until the driver slumps over in his seat and the car rolls through a wooden fence and over a cliff to a massive explosion against the rocks below. Because <laughs> you got to get that into the movie. Yeah. Seems like there's one thug left standing from the film's inciting incident, nicknamed Nirvana, and he makes a run for it while Kersey rushes to the fallen inspector. I'll be damned, you... You stuck your neck out for me? It was you or them. <laughs> Did you get them all? One of them got away. Get the motherfucker for me. Approaching sirens scare Kersey from the scene, and the first cops to arrive pronounce Ochoa dead. The gang member shot through the car is still alive and informs the cops that Nirvana killed Ochoa and he just fled the scene. We cut back to the office of the radio station. The bigwig is complaining about the price of the new building's entranceway that Kersey has added to the scale model of the building. Your wife is a very expensive designer. She wants Italian marble, Mexican mosaic, sculpted angels blowing horns on either side of the doorway. But as an alternative option, Kersey provides a mock-up done in plain concrete instead. (laughs) We'll just just make a mold out of concrete and then... But what? you can tell that even the even the building manager is like, yeah, my wife's not going to go for that. <laughs> you wasted but your time. Why is his wife making these decisions yeah, about this weird. anyways? I don't understand this business relationship. <laughs> Maybe it's like uh, 
that uh, Coca-Cola executive from Mommy Dearest where it's like my wife is just m- forcing me to spend every yeah. cent that yeah. comes into the company borrowing against my shares to, to pay for a nice apartment. Wandering aimlessly around the station, Kersey overhears reporters listening to police scanners for details on the previous night's shooting in Point Furman Park. Kersey asks if they just happen to have a spare police scanner. No reason, <laughs> just curious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was one that we were going to get rid of. He hands Kersey a scanner and tells him exactly how to dial into the channel the local police tend to operate on. He spends the whole next day crashed out beside the radio like Mr. Incredible on bowling night. He hears the cops discussing Nirvana's location and drives to the same neighborhood. Nirvana heads into a building with a girl under each arm, and the cops are ordered by their commanding officer to wait for Nirvana to come back outside. Kersey is under no such obligation and rushes into the building. One of the cops even spots him climbing around on the roof, but they can't tell if he's one of the cops, so they do nothing to stop him. So let's not investigate. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. came out of the roof. I, I feel like he could have just walked in the front door. Right. Because you could, for all intents and purposes, live here. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, cause if, if no one recognizes him from the roof, who's going to recognize him yeah. from the front door? It didn't give him a tactical advantage to be coming down from above. What ends up happening here? In a stairwell, Kersey overhears a fight between Nirvana and one of the girls, and Nirvana turns and slashes Kersey's arm with a knife. Nirvana flies out into the street and beats the shit out of, like, 20 cops by himself. <laughs> He's flipping cops up in the air like yeah. they're burgers, just like, huh, huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Kersey just watches it all from a fire escape. That night in the apartment, he cleans up his bloodied arm, mirroring a similar scene in the first film, dressing a bullet wound in his shoulder. He continues on home, where he's surprised at the door by Jerry. She shows him a newspaper headline about Ochoa's death, but Kersey's arm is still bleeding profusely, and he tries to distract her from his dripping red sleeves. He invites her to a nice dinner, and she says she'd like to clean up first. Kersey promises to pick her up from her place in an hour. She looks again at the headline about the dead New York cop. You know, I rather liked him. He was nutty, just like I told you. Well, at least they caught the man that killed him. See you later. In a quick courtroom scene, we learn that Nirvana was able to juggle an entire SWAT team because he was high on PCP. (laughs) They incarcerate him at a local state hospital. By complete coincidence, (laughs) Jerry happens to be prepping for an interview with the doctor who will be supervising Nirvana, and Kersey claims not to have much faith in the rehabilitative powers of the hospital. Jerry offers to put Kersey in contact with the doctor in charge of Nirvana, and we cut right to Kersey arriving at McLaren State Hospital with her. Upon meeting the doctor, Kersey asks for directions to the men's room, and then disregards those directions when he sees a room labeled Doctor's Changing Room. I'm just really bothered by, once again, he's like, allowed access to mm-hmm. this space via like Jerry. Right. And it doesn't make sense because the doctors, you know, he's like, hey, thanks for, for letting me come. And the doctor's like, yeah, the more people know about this stuff, the better. And mm-hmm. it's just so weird and cheesy to try to like, you know, push away the fact that this makes no sense that yeah. he's allowed to be here. Like if if I went with you to your work and you worked at a jail, they wouldn't be like, yeah, wander around. <laughs> I don't give a shit. A, a, more, a more believable... Uh, line would have been I'd like to see how a mental hospital holds up architecturally like what the layouts are like yeah yeah, yeah. because like say I may, yeah, I've got use, a line use his career for some reason yeah it's like I, a hospital did a bid and I need to see what a hospital layout looks like right like something the, to get the, him in the yeah. fact that he's an architect is never relevant to <laughs> any of these movies but I also love that the he says where's the men's room and he's like oh let me show you it's down the hall to the left two doors down to the right like, that's, not that's, showing. that's not show <laughs> <laughs> that's tell not show take a screenwriting course and then doesn't he like correct himself he's like I'm yeah. right yeah no right and mm-hmm. I'm like what what? Just what so is that the point when, of this? The point of that is so that we remember he corrected himself and said the right, so that w- when we see Kersey going to the left, we know, oh, he's not following the directions oh. that guy gave him. Because I think I think from the doctor's perspective, it was it's left to the doctor's restroom. Mm. And so doctors what, are inverted from people. Yeah. It's part of the ceremony. <laughs> After they do the sword on either shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what a doctor is. <clears throat> that, that's why the prescriptions you can't read them because they're yeah. their non-dominant hand they use Sanskrit <laughs> they write you a Sanskrit <laughs> <laughs> he finds an unattended lab coat with a doctor's badge and at home later we see him whiting out all the identifying details and photocopying a blank counterfeit badge 
Sometime later, Kersey is out for lunch with Jerry when a bottle of Dom Perignon shows up at the table and she tries to guess the occasion. Can't be my birthday. That was last month. And you forgot. But that's all right. <laughs> Will you marry me? I like that he wo he doesn't even say, will you marry me? Mm. He says, will ya marry me? And he doesn't like show her a ring or kneel. No. He's just he's just like, hey, will you marry me? And she's like, of course I will. I'm so excited. She quickly accepts and runs around the table to hug and kiss him. Easy, easy. This stuff costs $3 a drop. That was a $9 kiss. I accept. That'll teach you. He reveals here that he has an entire Central American vacation planned for them and for their wedding. The ever stable Central America yeah. of the 1980s. <laughs> That's where we're going to go. <laughs> There's literally no reason to bring all this up, like, except for to, to make us think that she's going to get killed. But even if she did get killed, it wouldn't matter to us because we know that Kersey doesn't give a fuck about this woman. And I'm confused why he's even proposing to her. Like, we've never been given any indication that he cares about her. He proposed to her, but he's trying to lock her out of Come his apartment. On. No, but he didn't lock her out the second time. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I thought it was purely that he needs an alibi. Mm. Like, like. So they like, can leave town and let things cool down or yeah, something? Yeah, exactly. Okay. That night, we see Kersey struggling to fill in the blanks of his fake hospital badge. Not sure what's remotely difficult about this. <laughs> <laughs> but he made like a stack of like 12 of them. So he gave himself a lot of attempts to spell the word psychologist right. <laughs> name Paul Kersey. No, Fuck. no, no my name. Paul Kersey. <laughs> Vigilante. Fuck! No, not that either. Call Percy. <laughs> <laughs> and he does crumple the first attempt and then misses the wastebasket with it before writing his second attempt. It's like, you should not they shouldn't be hitting the floor until you fucked up at least 12 of these. <laughs> like, it should be the trash can is overflowing with psychologists misspelled over and over again. <laughs> he just writes a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Brain doctor. He attaches the finished badge to his stolen lab coat and returns to the hospital without Jerry this time. The whole point of going with Jerry a bunch of times is to develop a familiarity with the staff. Yeah. And now he's going in disguise as a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a doctor here the whole time. That's why I look so familiar. No, you're Paul Kersey. You came in here with your girlfriend like 12 times over the last month. Also, the doctor's name is embroidered on that lab coat. Yeah. It doesn't match yeah, you Yeah, I the know badge. Dr. Carter and you're not him. He asks a nurse where to find Charles Wilson, a.k.a. Nirvana. Kersey comes to a gate in a hallway and bangs on the door to rouse a guard. He introduces himself as a court-appointed therapist and asks to be pointed to Charlie Wilson's room. The man is hesitant to let him in without an appointment, but Kersey insists, and the guy opens the gate. On the way to Wilson's cell, the guard complains that they aren't allowed to shock inmates anymore because of the encroachment of woke shrinks. It's all done with kindness now. Isn't that right, Doctor? Therapy. Call it what you like. Okay, <laughs> whatever. The guard talks Wilson out into the hall, and Kersey does his best to look away from the prisoner until they're alone together to avoid spoiling the surprise. When Kersey finally pulls a gun, he waits too long to shoot, and Nirvana flips a table at him to knock it away. We cut to a TV broadcast with original footage of Henny Youngman doing stand-up on a TV, and the guard is distracted by this comedy from the sounds of a struggle in the cell. I said to my wife, where do you want to go for your anniversary? She said, I want to go somewhere I've never met before. I said, try the kitchen. Kersey and Nirvana punch each other back and forth for a while, and eventually Nirvana slips a shiv out of his shoe, which he probably would have used to escape this place soon if Kersey hadn't interrupted. It's a scalpel. Yeah. yeah. I, th That's I feel true, like yeah. shiv, shiv sounds... Like, like he made a very up. fancy shiv. It's, it's a, a, one of those pre-made shivs <laughs> that they use manufactured for shiv. surgery. <laughs> for shiv doctors. <laughs> he stabs Kersey repeatedly in the shoulder, but then drops the weapon and Kersey picks it up. Nirvana throws Kersey backward again against a big wall of electric panels. And when Kersey dodges a fist, Nirvana punches straight through a small glass window into one of the electrical panels. So Kersey flips the master power switch on and electrocutes the prisoner slash patient, just like the guard suggested. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's some it's some high voltage because you, you can hear the hum. Yeah, and you I can mean, see his hair f floating yeah. up. Kersey has won Charlie Wilson's war. Nirvana's hair sticks up from the charge, <laughs> and the noise of the device finally summons the guard back into the room. He puts together exactly what happened here pretty quickly, and Kersey doesn't bother faking an excuse in his fictional therapist character like, oh, he attacked me because you let him bring a yeah. fucking scalpel in here. He raped and killed my daughter. I read about it. 
Sympathetic to Kersey's cause, the guard offers him three minutes to get the fuck out before he phones in the incident, which is what happens at the end of nearly every Death Wish movie. It's always like, oh, he's dead to rights now, and the person's like, get the fuck out of here. Kersey retrieves his gun and toddles adorably down the hall back to freedom. He's like, (laughs) (laughs) you didn't get get wounded in the legs. Yeah. He's walking through a hospital just bleeding profusely from the chest, and everyone's like, see you, doctor. (laughs) Uh, doctor, you need to sign out. Sure. Just... <laughs> just... Uh, he just passes out against the counter. <laughs> On the road again, Kersey keeps hitting obstacles that slow him down. A bunch of people in a crosswalk, some kind of a road blockage. He drives past a marquee advertising a film we've covered. Did you catch it? No, oh, I didn't. What do you think I'm okay. referring to here? I think it's. I think this is the second one. Okay. So I I saw two. I, well, I, technically, I saw three movies. Okay. I, I think I missed the first couple then. Um. I think it's Exc- Excalibur. Yes, this one is Excalibur. Okay. Then previously, while he's wandering around the city, um, he's standing in front of a double feature. Oh, okay. And what's that? It is, um, I always forget which one's which. It's any which way but loose and any which way you can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of pot shots at Clint Eastwood and the Dirty Harry series mm. across this whole franchise. Meanwhile, back at his home, Jerry arrives, having given up waiting for Kersey to come pick her up. She lets herself in and turns up the news radio station to learn that the prisoner who killed Ochoa has been murdered within McLaren State Hospital. Simultaneously, she notices the crumpled paper ball beside the wastebasket and unrolls it to find the first failed attempt at a counterfeit hospital badge. She realizes instantly that Ochoa was telling the truth and she can't stay with Kersey. She removes her engagement ring and leaves it on the crumpled badge at Kersey's desk before driving away. Naturally, he arrives seconds later And without seeing him find the ring, we hard cut to the Hollywood sign the next morning. Kersey attends a party for the radio station's unveiling of the completed building plan, and we learn in conversation that Jerry has transferred to work in another town. Kersey is invited to another new building party, since apparently that's not what this is. (laughs) He accepts the invite. I'll be there. Are you sure you're free? What else would I be doing? Which is a lighthearted way of reminding his boss that his entire family was brutally murdered and his girlfriend just moved out of the state. (laughs) It's like, yeah, this is my job and everyone else I know fucking hates me or is dead. (laughs) We cut back outside where Kersey's shadow stalks the streets and a few gunshots ring out before credits roll over the city at night. The end. Worth mentioning some changes to the character from even the first film. In Death Wish 1, Kersey's family are attacked, raped, and killed, but we never actually see those thugs again. The rest of the film is spent catching and killing uninvolved criminals, where here he seems to mostly limit himself to the exact five guys that he clashed with on the day of the new attack. Although he does take a few people out Mm -hmm. extra on the way. As quickly as the third film, we'll see him killing people for breaking into cars and once for stealing a camera. (laughs) His trigger finger gets itchier and itchier (laughs) as we go. (laughs) FYI, I'm about to spoil the whole rest of the series. Not that there's much to spoil here in case you care. Maybe skip ahead a few minutes if if you're just about to sit down to them. Death Wish 3. In the third film, Kersey returns to New York to visit an old friend who is, of course, brutally murdered (laughs) seconds before (laughs) Kersey arrives. And so he's like, gets there in time to hear the guy's last words, which are like, take care of all my shit, I guess. <laughs> he doesn't really have an important message. I feel like at some point you'd be like, wait, your your wife was killed, your daughter was killed, your friend was killed. Yeah. I'm starting to suspect this guy's doing this all. <laughs> I love that them stepping it up, they were like, well, first his wife was killed, then his daughter was killed. Now, <laughs> an old friend who yeah, he yeah. <laughs> checks in on every once in a while died. We got to keep uh, escalating the story. My my local postman was killed. <laughs> Did you know him? No, he wasn't for my route, but he was very <laughs> he, close. He's the next street over. Yeah. In this third installment, Kersey's vigilantism is confined to a small neighborhood of tenement housing, and he no longer conducts his work in secret. He befriends and protects all the elder residents, home aloneing their apartments <laughs> to injure or kill the incessant intruders. Okay, that that actually sounds kind of yeah. Fun. Over the course of the story, Kersey becomes romantically involved with his public defender, played by Deborah Raffin, and you'll never guess what happens to her. Oh, God. (laughs) This time, the police chief, played by Ed Lauder, covertly approves of Kersey's actions and only asks to be kept aware of what he's doing. Death Wish 4. And I think the subtitle for Death Wish 4 is The Crackdown. (laughs) 
In the fourth film, we return to Los Angeles, where Kersey's vigilante habits catch the attention of a local millionaire whose daughter suffered a similar fate to Kersey's. He offers to provide Kersey with whatever he needs to eliminate a pair of local drug-dealing gangs who've left hundreds of local dead kids in their wake, including the daughter of Kersey's latest girlfriend, played by Kay Lenz. In the end, we learn, somewhat predictably, that the millionaire who hired him was actually the head of a third drug-dealing gang manipulating Kersey to take out all his competition. What, what year was this? Um, it's 80, late 80s. I was say, because he's got to be so much older, and Kay Lenz has to be right. like the, yeah. youngest, no, it gets, the youngest girlfriend of them all so they far. They keep getting younger. 87. As the film closes, Kersey brings the man down, but you'll never guess what happens to this girlfriend along the way. Uh, Kay Lenz also is murdered. We're back to New York for Death Wish 5, the final installment of the Bronson series, and mafiosos are muscling in on the local fashion business. <laughs> and in particular, Kersey's newest girlfriend, played by Leslie Ann Down, a full two years younger than the actress who played his daughter in this film, and four years younger than the woman who played his daughter in the first film. The villain of this chapter is played admittedly brilliantly by Michael Parks, but the story goes the same way it always does, and of course his girlfriend is once again killed. All right, next film, Death Sentence. So this was the film adaptation of the sequel written by the original author Garfield that wasn't accepted as a Bronson Death Wish film. In 2007, James Wan directed this adaptation. It stars Kevin Bacon, though not as Kersey, the character is renamed Nick Hume. He has a wife and two sons, but when his oldest is killed during a random gang initiation, the police inform him his son's killer will likely get a slap on the wrist due to insufficient evidence. Wait, so was the son joining a gang? Or no, the, some... the kid was at a gas station okay. waiting to pay for something when it was getting robbed by a guy who was trying to join a gang. Okay, okay. But when Kevin Bacon, as the father, learns that his son's killer will probably go free because all they have is Kevin Bacon's testimony and they don't have any evidence because th they literally say the only gas station in the whole city that doesn't have a camera security system. <laughs> it's like, how does he insure mm -hmm. this place without a camera security system? But, uh, but so he decides that he's going to flub the case on purpose in court to turn the kid loose so that he can deal with him himself. After Nick catches and kills his son's murderer, other members of the same gang respond by showing up at his house and killing his wife and putting his younger son in a coma. With nothing left to lose, Nick dives back into the gang's stronghold to take them out one at a time and avenge his family. So the point of this film was to be, don't be a vigilante. It's stupidly dangerous and mm -hmm. they'll kill your entire family if you do it. And then uh, the most recent film, actually, yeah, the most recent film I'll be discussing is the Death Wish 2018. That's Eli Roth's remake of the first film, casting Bruce Willis in the Paul Kersey role and changing his profession from architect to surgeon. He's troubled by the constant flow of gunshot victims through his workplace until one day his wife and daughter are rolled in. His wife dies and the daughter is in a coma while Kersey takes to the streets to avenge them. His work is caught on camera phone and goes viral, igniting a citywide debate on the ethics of vigilantism. And it goes, of course, how they all go. Wife dies, coma kid wakes up, and uh, everything's terrible, but he kills everybody. Is that... Uh, is D'Onofrio? Yeah, or, he's his yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah. Or, was, or was it Vince Vaughn? Who was, who was the... Was it, it was no, it was D'Onofrio. It was D'Onofrio, yeah. yeah. Well, what's weird too... Okay, so Death Wish... I mean, we're going to discuss this probably uh, for the next film. But in Death Wish, they for no reason set up the son-in-law as like a red herring throughout mm. the entire film. He's just very like off and weird. The same thing is the case with D'Onofrio in the 2018 Death Wish, where at the beginning, he's Bruce Willis's brother, and they are very close... But he's always, like, in debt to people, like, people that mm. are scary. And so he's constantly borrowing money from his his brother um, to pay off his debts. And he's, like, loves his niece, like, the most in the world. And everybody gets along really great. But it's very clear from the first act of this movie that some draft of the story implies that D'Onofrio owed money to some people. And he told them that his, his brother had a safe in his house with a mm. bunch of money in it. And so they hit that house on purpose. Right based on information from D'Onofrio. But the, we go through the whole story and occasionally he owes money to people and he borrows it from Bruce Willis, pays them off, and that's it. That's the end. Like, there's no arc to his character. He's just, like, the one who keeps coming back and telling Paul Kersey, you need to stop doing this vigilante stuff because he finds out that he's doing it and, right, and right. forces him to go straight. But it just seems, like, so obvious that the point of this was originally that he confesses that he gave them the address because they promised him they were just going to go get the safe and mm -hmm. that would be it. And he didn't want his his 
sister-in-law or his niece to get hurt. Yeah, I, I, I remember having watched it and was just pretty forgettable about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, the only other one that I watched for this, because I did watch all of these for this, um, was uh, Dino De Laurentiis' Death Wish clone that he produced at the same time as this film was coming out. It's called Fighting Back, and uh, we'll get to it later this season, but it follows protagonist John DeAngelo, played by Tom Skerritt, who's disgusted by the encroachment of roving gangs in his neighborhood. One day, his mother is attacked at a corner store, and the mugger uses pruning shears to cut off her wedding ring, but she survives... Um, and in response to Angelo forms like an armed neighborhood watch style militia. And so they're getting all this press for fighting back against the city thugs and it becomes really popular. It gets a lot of, a lot of, uh, news stories and D'Angelo takes things a step further by when the local politicians start harassing him and telling him to shut it down and that what he's doing is wrong and dangerous. And he says, if you're not going to protect us, then we will. So he starts running for office. Mm. And so the second half of the movie is about him trying to replace the politicians with his newfound local popularity. Um, but that's fighting back and we'll get to that later. But yeah, so that's the entire Death Wish franchise <laughs> summarized very quickly. This movie is significantly worse than the first one because the first one felt like a gritty serious real thing and this one feels like a cartoon yeah. with a couple rape scenes that are meant to be pornographic instead of harrowing and that's a weird choice for this franchise and also winner is on the record saying things like oh it's different because it takes place in a new city and i, I there was some quote that was like winner specifically said uh rape is always in date like mm. it's it's a thing that people always want to see so it's great you can just put it in every movie yeah and it'll be just as popular great so that's why we did it again that's so, a what a wonderful mentality yeah um but it totally wasn't necessary here it doesn't it doesn't move the story forward it's not an important character building thing and it seems like they just wanted to have the exact same scene where mom is killed daughter is raped and and Kersey is mad, but they instead made the wife like an an un a woman that's not actually connected to him romantically, so that he can have this relationship on the side. Mm -hmm. Right. But yeah, the first two kills are very unsatisfying. Like on top of that, the, right. It's just like the Jesus you, one. Yeah, it's like it's like okay, it's a great line, but then you just shoot him and you walk away. It's like yeah. well, no, these these guys did something really terrible, and they need to die and are really because even the the Bruce Willis one, I feel like some of the deaths in that one were a little bit more oh my God, yeah. vengeful. Yeah, there's some really fun stuff in there because it's Eli Roth. Doesn't he like so drop a car on somebody? Or like one of the guys gets a car dropped on him. There's yeah. another guy who, because um, at the end they're like breaking into his home and he's having to kill them all within his home while his daughter is hiding in like a crawl space under the stairs. And one guy gets shoved over the railings from the top and lands right on the top of his head on the, on the floor like mm. – straight down at the bottom of the spiral staircase and you see his whole head oh, like God. cave in when he hits the ground <laughs> it looks awesome yeah and so like that death and then the guy with the forklift is like okay cool he dodges a forklift but right right, right. but then he just just shoots him and then it's like oh okay and yes, every everyone is just like a tossed off like half-assed nothing line the the only like really exciting shootout is the one at the at the gun there, yeah the gun sale right and uh and and even so like the one guy gets away and then and I also lose count because there were five gang members at the beginning of the film. Yeah. And the, and he's following three of them this whole night, and he gets to this shootout where Ochoa kills the sniper, Kersey shoots one guy in the gut, and then he hits – I think there's – it seems like there's four gang members that he's shooting at here because it looks like he kills four guys here. Or he kills two guys because we see him mm -hmm. shoot – because there's the, the the dealer yeah is there the gun the arms dealer is there maybe, maybe that's what it is and I'm just mixing up it, one of the arms dealers got killed and it looked like one of the gang members yeah yeah I think two gang members get shot here and one gets away yeah and and one of the two that gets shot here gets taken to a hospital and dies later yeah. well right. he di he dies there he dies. in the park oh yeah yeah he dies on the scene right and then the other two were the guy in the forklift who got killed and then the guy in the drug deal basically yeah in the in the hollywood hotel so that, with all that, the rest. That, so that would be five yeah but um yeah there's there's no reason to watch this if you've seen the first one you've seen everything this film has to offer yeah um you could probably skip right to the third one which turns into like kind of a children's film version of a death wish movie because it's just kind of silly and fun and 
you know, he's swinging paint cans and sprinkling micro machines. And um, <laughs> it's it's a lot of nonsense. Um, and they get cornier and cornier as you go. The last one is so, like, polished and silly. Um, yeah. And plus he has to be almost 70. Right. Yeah. No, it's very strange. Yeah. So that's Death Wish and all the Death Wishes. Um, I'll probably have to go over a lot of this again <laughs> in a few more weeks when we get to our review of Death Wish 1. Is this the first time we reviewed a sequel before the original? Uh, oh, well, we reviewed sequels without seeing originals before, for sure. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember a time where we ended up going back and covering something mm. earlier in the franchise. Maybe we did that for James Bond or something. What are we thinking? Thumbs up, thumbs down. It's a big thumbs down for me. Oh, it's a thumbs down. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. sure, thumbs down. Um, what are we thinking, Letterboxd? Uh, so I have it pretty low because I never want to see this movie again. Uh, I have it at 23 out of 25. I have it below McVicker and above Love and Money. Richard? Uh, bottom of the list. Really? It's, it's, it's number 25. All right. Uh, be- which puts it below Mad Men. I'd rather watch Mad Men. All right. Then I guess I loved this movie. Um, I have it in 17th, so it's under the seduction but above the amateur. I didn't love this movie. <laughs> The director, writer, and editor was Michael Winner. He previously directed The Mechanic, the Zodiac-inspired Scorpio, and the first Death Wish film. He also directed Robert Mitchum's first Marlowe film, The Big Sleep, and he returns to the Death Wish series for the third installment. David Engelbach, this was his first screenplay credit. Later he writes and directs America 3000. He writes Stallone's arm wrestling road movie Over the Top, and his final credit was on MacGyver episode Gold Rush, for which I had the opportunity to interview him for our previous podcast, The Phoenix Foundation. The conversation didn't touch much on this film, but we do go over America 3000 and Over the Top a bit. The writer here was Brian Garfield, a character credit for writers, because obviously this was not his story. He has character credits on all the subsequent Death Wish sequels and remakes, and he also wrote the novels adapted into Walter Matthau's spy story Hopscotch and the Stepfather series. The music here came from Jimmy Page. He's best known as the guitarist and founder of rock band Led Zeppelin. This is his first film composer credit, and he returns to score the third film. He also has a soundtrack credit on 98's Godzilla film, because Puff Daddy's theme for the film, Come With Me, sampled heavily from Led Zeppelin's Cashmere. Cinematographer here was Thomas Del Ruth. Previously on the show, he lit Motel Hell and Underground Aces. After this, he lights Breakfast Club, Stand By Me, The Running Man, Look Who's Talking, and Talking Too, and later, 107 episodes of The West Wing. The other cinematographer, Richard H. Klein, he also lit Camelot, The Boston Strangler, Andromeda Strain, The Mechanic, Soylent Green, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, The Fury, and so far in our 80s titles, Touched by Love, The Competition, and Body Heat. He still has Love Spell coming later this season. And beyond that, he lights Breathless, All of Me, The Man with One Red Shoe, Howard the Duck, My Stepmother is an Alien, and Double Impact. Editor credit here for Julian Similian. This is their first editor credit, and later he cuts Scanner Cop. Charles Bronson played Paul Kersey. He has unnamed credits back to the early 50s. He played the titular Machine Gun Kelly in the 58 film. He was Bernardo O'Reilly in The Magnificent Seven. Danny the Tunnel King in The Great Escape, and Wladislaw in The Dirty Dozen. We've seen him now in The Mechanic, Cabo Blanco, Borderline, and Death Hunt, and he's also in two of our current Patreon poll contenders, The First Death Wish and Mr. Majestic, which both hit theaters in July of 74. After this, Bronson does three more Death Wish films, and then Ten to Midnight and The Evil That Men Do. Jill Ireland played Jerry Nichols. She met actor David McCallum on the set of Hell Drivers in 1957 and appeared with him on several episodes of The Man from UNCLE. Later, he brought her to the set of The Great Escape and introduced her to co-star Charles Bronson, and five years later she had divorced McCallum and married Bronson. They would appear in 13 films together, including one we've covered on the show, The Mechanic, and although she doesn't appear in any further Death Wish films, she does show up with him in The Evil That Men Do, Murphy's Law, and Assassination. I think last time she was like a prostitute that he goes to and she writes poetry for him or something like that. In the, in mechanic. the mechanic? Yeah. yeah, that sounds familiar. Vincent Gardinia was Detective Frank Ochoa. He's a bartender in The Hustler. He's Coach Williams in Where's Papa. We saw him previously as the mayor in Cold Turkey. 
He obviously plays this same character in the previous Death Wish film, and we've seen him in the 80s now for Home Movies and Last Flight of Noah's Ark, later he's Mushnik in Little Shop of Horrors, Cosmo in Moonstruck, and his final credit as Big Lou in The Super. I think that's Danny DeVito's dad. Yeah, yeah, the one who's like giving leaves him the him building. Yeah. Or is it Joe Pesci? Oh, yeah, Joe Pesci. Joe Pesci, yeah. yeah. Between the two Death Wish films, he also worked with director Winner on something called Firepower in 79. J.D. Cannon played the New York D.A., he plays Society Red in Cool Hand Luke, Danzig in Krakatoa East of Java, and Phil Chalk in Scorpio. We've seen him so far in Raise the Titanic. Anthony Franciosa played Herman Baldwin. He was previously in A Face in the Crowd and The Drowning Pool, and he's back this season in Kiss My Grits. Ben Frank played Inspector Mankiewicz. We've seen him so far in Don't Answer the Phone and Foxes, which both released on the same day in 1980. He also showed up in Falling in Love Again, and he reunites with that film's director for Slapstick of Another Kind a couple seasons from now. Later, he appears in Hollywood Vice Squad, from the makers of Vice Squad, I believe, but unrelated technically. Robin Sherwood played Carol Kersey. We've seen her now in Loose Shoes, Hero at Large, Serial, and Blowout, but this is her last feature credit. Silvana Gallardo played Rosario. We saw her last as Little Feather in Windwalker. Mostly television after this, including an appearance we've already discussed on MacGyver episode Jack of Lies, in which we mentioned that she was also the wife of Billy John Bly Drago of Briscoe County Jr. fame. Robert F. Lyons played Fred McKenzie. He reunites with Bronson in Ten to Midnight and Murphy's Law. Michael Prince played Elliot Cass. We've seen him as a civilian in Three Days of the Condor and in the 80s for Hero at Large, Force 5, and Rollover. Drew Snyder played Deputy Commissioner Hawkins, mostly TV before this. We've seen him so far in Night School, and later he shows up in War Games, Firestarter, The Falcon and the Snowman, Commando, Jade, Nixon, and the 1996 The Fan. Paul Lambert played the New York Police Commissioner, again, mostly TV before this, uncredited role in The Godfather, and he's an editor in All the President's Men, a messenger in Apocalypse Now, and after this, it's back to mostly television. Thomas F. Duffy played Nirvana. This was his first feature. Later, he's a construction worker in The Abyss, a lieutenant in Independence Day, Figgy in the 96 The Fan, he's Dr. Burke in The Lost World, and he's Rooney in Super 8. He's also James Vanderbeek's football-obsessed dad in Varsity Blues. He's literally the guy whose life James mm. Vanderbeek doesn't want. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want your life. <laughs> Kevin Major Howard played Stomper. He appears as an extra in Scarface. He's Hawkins in Sudden Impact. And he's Rudyard Kipling in Alien Nation. What a weird credit. Mm -hmm. He's probably best known for his performances as Rafter Man in Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. Stuart K. Robinson played Jiver. He was Johnny in Rocky II, and later he's in Better Off Dead. Larry Fishburne is Cutter. One of his first film roles was as Clean in Apocalypse Now. We've seen him so far as a student in Willie and Phil, and after this he shows up in Rumblefish, The Cotton Club, The Color Purple, Nightmare on Elm Street 3. He was famously Cowboy Curtis on Pee Wee's Playhouse. He's in Boys in the Hood. What's Love Got to Do With It, Searching for Bobby Fischer, Event Horizon, but he's likely best known for his turn as Morpheus in the Matrix trilogy. Since then, he's been Perry White in the DC Universe, Bill Foster, a.k.a. Goliath in Ant-Man and the Wasp, and he's the Bowery King in the John Wick films. More recently, he was MacGruber's boss in the eight-episode Peacock series. That's a really fun mm. sequel series, actually. Um, he's also in Coppola's latest controversial title, Megalopolis. E. Lamont Johnson played Punk Cut, he was a detective in Foxes, and this was his last feature film. Paul Comey played Senator McLean. Before this, he's a policeman in Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. Tim in The Towering Inferno, and we've seen him so far as Commander Craig in The Killings at Outpost Zeta. That was obviously a minisode. Later, he's Dr. Shapin in Howard the Duck. Frank Capanella played Judge Neil A. Lake. Before this, he's in Capone in 75. He's in Heaven Can Wait. He was never on Pee-wee's Playhouse with Fishburne, but he does play Captain Carl in Overboard. <laughs> yeah. There's a Captain Carl character in that. He's also in Beaches, Pretty Woman, and Dick Tracy. Hugh Warden played Minister. He was Earthman in Galaxina and a bank dick in Modern Romance. He's back later this season as a grocer in Honky Tonk Man. Jim Begg played Tourist. He also shows up in The Ghost and Mr. Chicken, and he was a producer on the first Leprechaun movie. Steven Zacharias played Dr. Clark. He shows up in a handful of spaghetti westerns, A Man Called Sledge, Pocket Full of Chestnuts, and They Call Me Trinity. And next we'll see him as a prisoner in The Ice Pirates, and then Pop in Exterminator 2. 
Don Moss played Cabby. He's Don in Dungeon Master and a Mater D in St. Elmo's Fire. Charlie Cyphers played Donald K. He was Bracket in Carpenter's Halloween. And in the late 80s, he's in A Force of One and Onion Field. We've seen him now as Dan O'Bannon in The Fog, mm -hmm. as Ski alongside Bronson in Borderline, and as the Secretary of State in Escape from New York, but most recently reprising the role of Lee Brackett in Halloween 2. Later this season, he's in Honky Tonk Man, and later he's Charlie Donovan in Major League. His most recent credit is another reprisal of the Brackett character for David Gordon Green's Halloween sequel trilogy. Peter Pan played... <laughs> <coughs> Peter Pan played Chinese Landlord, <laughs> He was a tourist in Under the Rainbow. That's all I have. It's just uh, an Asian <laughs> yeah. guy's name, Peter Pan. I wonder if that's his real name. How unfortunate would that be? David Daniels played Lang. We've seen him now in Fade to Black and Scared to Death. He actually has my favorite line in Fade to Black when the protagonist, Eric Binford, is for no reason trying to convince a guy at a hot dog stand that Marilyn Monroe is still alive. <laughs> and he gets weirdly angry about it. He you said you're wrong. She's alive. It's you and I. She's dead. She's dead, you jerk! Leslie Graves played Nirvana's girl number two. She's back as Allison Dumont in Piranha later this season. Teresa Baxter played Nurse One. We saw her last as Mary Ann in It's My Turn, and she's back later in The Sure Thing. Cindy Daly played Nurse Two. She was Cora and Carrie, and she's credited as Three Fingered Typist in Beetlejuice as her last credit. Who is the Three Fingered Typist? It's got to be someone in the Office of the Dead. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's not the... It's not Miss Argentina. It's not the the caseworker Juno. Well, well they pan over like a full office of okay. people. Yeah. So I well, would maybe imagine Well, maybe there's somebody that's there. like hunting and pecking, or maybe she literally has three fingers. Yeah. <laughs> Joshua Gallegos played Policeman 2. He has credits in Star Trek The Motion Picture and The Three Amigos. Paul McCallum played Ambulance Man. This is his first film. He has four more, all Bronson titles, Ten to Midnight, Murphy's Law, Act of Vengeance, and Assassination. And he's even the credited composer of Death Wish 4. Roberta Collins played Woman at Party. She has credits in all the great exploitation titles. The Big Dollhouse, Women in Cages, Unholy Rollers, Caged Heat. And she's Matilda the Hun in Death Race 2000. She shows up in Toby Hooper's Eaten Alive, the boxing kangaroo film Matilda. And we've seen her so far as Cousin Rhonda in Saturday the 14th. C. Ransom Walrod played Boat Captain. This was his first feature. He's credited as a party animal in Scrooged, and he's Boat Captains in both Hot Shots Part 2 and The Lost World. The boat he takes Paul and Carol for a ride on here was his actual boat. Hmm. Ava Lazar played Girl in TV Soap Opera. She's back this season to play Sharon in Night Shift and a playmate in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Henny Youngman played himself on a television. He's a beloved Catskills comic, king of the one-liners, and the creator of maybe the most quoted stand-up joke of all time, which he actually tells on stage in the Copacabana in Scorsese's Goodfellas. Henny Youngman! How are you all? I'm glad to be here. Take my wife, please. Oh, I thought it was going to be the how do you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice. In a body bag. <laughs> Is there a story of why Henny Youngman was just filmed? I don't know. It, and it's not like stock footage or something. Yeah, it, it's no, literally I, like they put him up against a wall and yeah. just shot three jokes. Well, or was this like a Bela Lugosi thing? It's like, I got this last clip oh of God. Henny Youngman. Oh, he's still he, around. He's still alive. Yeah. Because yeah. he was like, Henny Youngman was in an episode of Tiny Toon Adventures yeah. in the 90s. His most recent credit for us was as a writer of the jokes of the Heartbeeps comedian robot Catskill, and we'll hear more of his jokes later this season in the comeback trail. He's also Manny the Mesopotamian on the Adam West Batman, and he's in Silent Movie and History of the World Part 1. William Bogert played Fred Brown. Lots of one-off TV credits to start. We've seen him now in Last Married Couple in America and Hero at Large, but more recently, I would say he's best known for his part as the host of maybe the funniest sketch in the entirety of The Chappelle Show. How could this have happened? A black white supremacist. Vatsala Das played Hari Krishna. They're also a Hari Krishna in Angel next year. And Pavani Devi Dasi was another Hari Krishna, also a Hari Krishna in Falling Down. Both of them are actual Hari Krishnas that they just used because they were around the set. Do you recall the last time we had a Hari Krishna prominently featured? Oh my gosh. Well, we had some in Airplane and before that in uh, Midnight Madness. 
Um, not even, those aren't even the two I was thinking of. After, <laughs> after Airplane. I think we had some in Serial, too. Um, or maybe it wasn't Hardy Krishna. I'm thinking of the one where the daughter actually like joins the cult. That was in Serial. That's Serial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and that was a cult. I don't think it was technically Hardy okay. Krishna. They were all, all wearing right. like purple cloaks. But don't they like approach her with flowers? Yeah, they like, do. Yeah, yeah it's okay. very Hardy Krishna-esque. Yeah. Terry Leonard played the sniper in the tree. He's a longtime stuntman with credited roles in films we've covered like A Man Called Horse, Mountain Men, Inside Moves, The Legend of the Lone Ranger, and Raiders before this. Michael Laprie played a gang member. We just saw him as a track fan in Personal Best, and he's back right away as the pizza man in E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Harvey Mragendra Mechanic played another Hare Krishna, and he's another Hare Krishna in Falling Down. So a couple Hare Krishnas from Falling Down here because they were just... Los Angeles area right. Hari Krishnas who wandered around film sets a lot. <laughs> Can you sign this release? Yeah. I think that's everything we have for Death Wish 2. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. If you enjoy what we're doing, consider giving us a review on iTunes. I don't think it helps visibility, but it's good for morale. And if you really like the show, maybe you should join our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast for access to all our monthly 70s reviews and a hand in choosing next month's film. What's that sound? That's right, it's a new patron, Glenn Burgess. As a $5 patron of the show, Glenn now has access to 52 full-size 70s reviews and a hand in choosing next month's film. Patrons are currently choosing between The Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz, Death Wish, The Education of Sonny Carson, Flesh Gordon, Golden Needles, Gone in 60 Seconds, Mr. Majestic, My Name is Nobody, Savage Sisters, The Tamarind Seed, Uptown Saturday Night, and The White Dawn for a 50th anniversary review next month. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Over the Edge, which IMDb describes like so. A group of bored teenagers rebel against authority in the community of New Granada after the death of one of their own.